this is Marvin Glotfelty. I'm a hydrogeologist and licensed driller from Arizona, here with another industry connected video from the National Groundwater Association. Glad to have you here. Today's topic is drilling fluids. Um, just an overview. Um, there's, I know that uh, in future editions of the Water Well Journal, there'll be some columns on this with much more uh, knowledgeable mud engineers. But I was a mud engineer for a while back in my younger days. And so I wanted to go over just a couple of general aspects, a little bit of an overview of drilling fluid because it's real important stuff when we're uh, uh, out there drilling a well. Let's consider some of the primary properties that we look at. Now, most drill crews will look at viscosity, the resistance to flow of the fluid, the weight of the fluid, and some of them will have a filter press, so they'll measure the uh, filtrate, that's the water loss, how much water is pushed out into the formation, tells you how thick that wall cake is going to be. So those are the three primary ones, but there are a few other properties that are worth uh, consideration. One is the, the chemistry. Uh, we have a number of different chemicals, but primarily the pH, hardness, and the uh, calcium concentration in the makeup water. So if you have makeup water that has, say, hardness, so it has high calcium or magnesium, that calcium and magnesium is going to have ion exchange. It's going to take the place of the sodium and sodium bentonite. So the bentonite won't work as well. You put a bunch of gel into the drilling fluid, but you don't get the viscosity you expect. So you've spent the money, but you haven't gotten the result. That's not good. So um, that's why we always add a little soda ash and we soften that water before we add our anything else, any other chemistry. So, and we want that pH to be a little bit high. We don't want acidic water. We want it a little bit basic. So above seven, maybe eight or nine. In some cases, uh, when I was a, a mud engineer, we would get it very high up to 10 or, or more. So depends on what you're really addressing. Uh, you, want, you want that drilling fluid to do a number of things. And then we also have the rheology. Now the rheology is a little hard to understand. So we have, uh, we have our drilling fluid and that's not the same stuff as water. Water, as just a common example, is a kind of a liquid that reacts in very predictable ways, as does drilling fluid. But drilling fluid, again, it's a different kind of, of a fluid. It's called fixotropic. That means that when it sits still, it'll tend to gel up like a pudding. When you push it and move it, it will thin back out. And that's a good property for drilling fluid, if you think about it, because what happens if your pump goes out while you're circulating cuttings up the hole, and now they're halfway up the hole? And if your pump goes out or your engine goes out or something like that happens and you can't pull the bit up off bottom, all those cuttings will fall down around the bit and you get, get stuck. So the drilling fluid has the property that it'll hold those cuttings halfway up the hole where they are. Just just put a, put a pause on them until you circulate again and then it'll flush them on out. That's called gel strength. So it's a nice property and it comes with this thixotropic nature of drilling fluid. There's a couple of other properties that so many people just don't understand, and that's uh, called plastic viscosity and yield point. And so I'm going to share my screen here. So this is one that's from my book, uh, The Art of Water Wells, and I just think this is a, makes it so much easier for me to explain to you. This red line here is if you have a Newtonian liquid. That's like water. So shear stress just means you put a pressure on the liquid, like we call it hydro. Uh, hydraulic head, but it's just a pressure on the liquid. And then shear rate, that just means the, the liquid's flowing. So if you push on water, and so you go up this line, that's what happens, the water flows. You push on it, it'll flow. Just down, like downhill flow, that's what this is. Now this is slope here, is the viscosity. So if it's higher um, slope, then it's less viscous, and if it's a lower slope, it's more viscous. And so, um, so the, the viscosity is the line here. So that's for a Newtonian liquid. That's not drilling fluid. Drilling fluid is this blue line. That's a Bingham plastic liquid. This is like drilling fluid, toothpaste, mayonnaise, stuff like that. So you push on that stuff, 
it's not going to immediately flow. It'll resist it and resist it and resist it until finally it starts flowing. You push hard enough, it'll start flowing. But when it starts flowing, that's the yield point. That's what yield point means, the, pl the place where it starts to flow. And when it does flow, it has a slope itself. And that is not viscosity, that's plastic viscosity. So pretty simple, but this is what we're talking about, the difference between um, between a Newtonian and a Bingham plastic uh, fluid. So what does drilling fluid do for us? Several things. First of all, and foremost, it stabilizes the hole. It keeps the hole, borehole pressure. We fill to the brim this borehole. We might have a thousand foot hole uncased. If it's a casing advanced method like cable tool or dual rotary, then we'll be fine. We'll hold the hole open with our casing. If it's hard rock um, or a stable formation, we can drill with compressed air or foam or something, and that's okay because the hole will stay open on its own. But if we have a hole of unconsolidated sediment that wants to cave in, then this fluid filling it up is what will hold it open because the pressure pushing out is greater than the pressure pushing in. So even if we have formation pressures like artesian conditions, we can overcome those with our drilling fluid. So that's one thing it does. Second thing, it improves our drilling efficiency. So drilling fluid cools and lubricates the bit. It moves the cuttings from beneath the bit where they're broken up out to the side, circulates them up the borehole to the land surface. And then in the mud pit, it lets them drop out as we circulate from one end to the other end through baffles on the mud pit. So that even if we don't have desanders and desilters, the, the solids will drop out so that we can recirculate and reuse our drilling fluid in a closed system. So that's the second thing. Um, we, we can then also address our physical and chemical issues with a well. So uh, we may have, let's say we drill into some gypsum. That means a lot of that calcium is going to be contributed to our, our drilling fluid. But we can adjust the drilling fluid as we go. We can adjust our properties, measure them, and adjust them. That's why uh, we want to have a mud engineer come out to the rig site, test the mud on site, adjust it as you go, because it's we're interacting with Mother Nature. There's a lot of unknowns, and we want to be able to um, go back. Um, we always think of the uh, drilling fluid as being a single property. You know, we test it one time. The, the mud engineer comes out and he does the test and he writes everything down and puts it up in the doghouse and we know what the property is. Well, that's uh, a little bit misleading because when I was a mud engineer, we one time had a borehole that had formation pressures and it would kick, which is basically a, a, a small level of a blowout. Um, so that's a bad thing. And um, it also was an area where the upper part of the borehole had bad loss circulation situations. And so if we let the weight get too high, uh, half a pound per gallon higher than, than a, a certain level, then we would lose circulation, the, the column of drilling fluid would drop and therefore it would kick. Uh, if we got the pressure too low by a half a pound per gallon, then we wouldn't have adequate downhole pressure and it would kick. Well, I hate kicks. That's like standing by a, a jet engine. It's kind of scary and you can have, you know, bad things happen. You can have people hurt. So I was trying to keep that drilling fluid within a half a pound per gallon throughout. So I stayed at this site, uh, as, as sometimes mud engineers have to do, for about uh, 30 hours. And uh, it was at one of those all-nighters where I was checking the mud weight back to back to back to back. And I learned from that uh, how lumpy um, drilling fluid can be. You know, it's not a single weight. You go around, it gets, oh, it's too heavy. Oh, it's too light. Oh, it's too heavy. Oh, it's too light all night long. Well, I was a dumb kid. And so by the morning, I would learned something that fluid is a little bit lumpy. It's, you're not in a laboratory. You're in a, you know, in that case, it was about a 5,000 foot hole. So uh, you had a lot of different lumps <laughs> to measure. So, um, the, the, the point is, we need to be mindful of what's really down there. You know, I, I find that talking to old drillers and tool pushers and such, you'll learn a lot about drilling fluid because they're there watching it and, re and seeing the results. So it's not a laboratory, uh, it's not a laboratory experiment. So 
um, what's this all mean for the end of the day for a water well? It means we did we do damage to the formation that we have to undo during well development or not? And so all these things are real important as we drill. And so, um, you know, I think that um, as with so many other things, we just need to have interaction and understanding between the drill crew and the owners of the well, including any hydrogeologists or consultants that might be involved so that we can all work together rather than against one another and try to do the best job we can. Thank you very much and stay safe out there.